Man, it is so stinking bright out, and I don't have any sun visors. Hey, can you shut that off? Sorry. Well, hello guys. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're doing well. You know, I decided to make just a special dedicated video for recovering these 1948 Chevrolet sun visors. These are the originals. They are quite faded. The originals having been gray, two-tone gray, they are now two-tone brown. Now out there in video land, you can find many, many videos on recovering sun visors. But one thing that seems to be lacking is um, these earlier sun visors from the 40s where there's a binding or a vinyl edging sewn all the way around as well as the finger tabs. Could find nothing like it online. Um, so just follow along and we'll see if we can get these recovered. I want to give you a reminder that I do not consider myself a professional upholsterer. We've gone through the entire upholstery in this car behind me, and if you haven't watched that, check it out. But uh, other than taking the course in school many years ago, I haven't done much since. So we're relearning a lot as we go. Projects like this, never done in my life before. So. Will I be successful? Come along and find out. Now if you do look for other videos on recovering sun visors, like I said, you'll find plenty of them out there and kind of a very long-standing industry standard is to take your sun visor frame and then they take a piece of thin chipboard, kind of like a, a non-corrugated thick cardboard and cut out the profile of your sun visor only you butterfly it so you have two symmetrical halves laid out in front of you then you cover glue and and cover the entire thing with your material so it can't move it can't go anywhere you fold that over your frame and then you sew around the edge so what you see is a seam all the way around the three edges this is different this was done with the cloth. There's a, a piece of masonite-like material inside of here, as you'll see. They laid the cloth over, and then they sewed a beautiful, beautifully intricate binding all the way around. I don't know what kind of super seamstress and her marvelous machine um, they had back then. <laughs> But when I work on these old cars, I never cease to be amazed at their skill and craftsmanship when you get into how they did things. Here's a piece of the binding from the other sun visor, and it's very thin. It's much, much thinner than the vinyl I have. It's just like the outer, the outer layer or something. I don't... I really don't know, but then they've doubled it over on each side and very intricately sewed it all the way around. Now I'm going to try to duplicate that as best I can, um, but it won't be this, this precise or this petite, if we want to be au français. Oui, oui, madame. No, I just want to powder my nose. Now I'm going to remove my little clips that kind of finish up the, the binding there. Well, this one's just let go of the, the material rip. We'll deal with that later.
a little rubber trim piece out of the tube there. Now you could simply recover the entire thing with the old material on yet if you so desired. Okay, there's our frame piece and our masonite. Now, if you wanted, you could come in and make the more modern style clamshell and sew it on, sew it around the edge, and then you could even come back and sew on, this is a piece of welting, but you could, you could come back and sew on the edging around that. Um, I'm trying to do this kind of more like they did it, um, but it really doesn't matter. One thing I am trying to avoid, however, is from making this profile more chunky. Um, by the time you add chipboard and material, you're probably adding eighth inch, three sixteenths, something like that, and that would just make that a whole lot more bulky, um, but probably doesn't matter too much. First thing I'm gonna do is give my new Dacron something to stick to. Just going to use the rattle can contact cement. Doesn't need to hold long term, just something to keep it in place while we're working on it. Give that a minute to set up. Now for our material. Now give yourself as much leeway as you want. I mean if you have plenty of material, don't bother cutting this exactly to size. Know what I mean? Um, this is probably a quarter to a half inch oversize. I could easily go two or three times that much and uh, just so much the better that you're not you're not fighting something too small. Um, so I would go ahead and cut it larger, you know, larger the better. But what I'm going to do first is uh, attach our finger, finger pads here directly opposite of each other. Now I want to make this as simple as possible. So I'm going to go spray the backs of these and I'll be right back. Okay, now I cut these finger pads a half inch taller than they need to be. Here's an original, and here's ours. You can see they're a half inch long, and that's because of the seam allowance. And I'm just going to eyeball center there on the apex of that curve. Do the same here. Alright, that shouldn't be able to move too much going through the sewing machine. Now this marvelous little machine here is a machine from across the pond. Uh, if you get interested in one, just search online for a Chinese cobbler sewing machine, something to that effect. You'll come up with a lot of results. And there are tons of videos out there on the, the use of these things, the setting them up, and the modification of them, even putting electric motors on there. But this is a hand crank machine. Um, and I bought it originally because I was approaching this project from a different angle. I was afraid my Juki sewing machine um, couldn't handle this project because our material isn't able to lay flat on the table because of the the frame piece. Um, so I thought this would probably be a better approach where that could hang off the edge and I could sew around the edge of the board. 
it ends up it's not going to be a problem, I don't believe. Um, but I'm still going to use this, A, because it's enjoyable. I, I just really kind of like using the thing. Um, I like the mechanisms and the sound it makes, and it's just a, just a really old school industrial age approach, you know. Um, but I can go nice and slow on these finger pads here with this hand crank machine, so that's what I'm going to do. Don't think you need one of these. Don't think you need a full-on industrial machine. There's a lot of ways you can approach stuff. Now you can see for yourself how that turned out, nice and consistent. Um, just really enjoy using it. I suppose a guy could use the thing for uh, an entire upholstery project. It would take you a little bit longer, and that machine comes in around $100, sometimes barely over, sometimes a little under, um, with free shipping. So it wouldn't. it's not a huge investment if you have a project you want to do and you don't want to uh, invest in an actual industrial machine. Having said this, um, having said that, this Juki I actually bought from a family member. Now it's a well-used machine that was in a factory environment. Um, bought it from someone and I paid maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty for it. So, you know, you can probably come across um, a pretty good deal on a on a real industrial machine um, and not have to resort to that but goodness it's it's cute and it's fun nevertheless what I'm gonna do next is pin this on our frame piece here I'm gonna fold this flap under now that's what gives a a finished edge around the rod here so we'll just be sure to get that on. Just want our edges even all the way across and then have about the same sticking out on both sides which we're looking pretty good. Now my apologies, I'm not a professional here, but <laughs> um, what I'm going to do to get right up to the edge on that masonite board in there, I'm going to use a foot that's basically half a foot. You can see the difference here. Um, so I'm going to change this out.
Now you can see for some reason I got off. I don't I don't know if I didn't have it seated all the way against the the crease on the basting tape there, but it starts out nice and thin and then we're getting by the time we get to the center it probably would have been half an inch. So I'm going to pull it back to here somewhere and we will uh, see if I can make a good good look and repair there. So all this foot worked great for pulling the material over the edge originally. Now it becomes a problem um, because it wants to pull this material away. It wants to do the same thing and I don't want it to do the same thing. I need to hold down on the, the board now and uh, sew down on the edge. So I'm going to try this multi-level foot here. Uh, I'm sorry I don't know the, the correct names but we'll uh, We'll give that a go and see if that works any better. So last night I was laying in bed, you know, preparing the old brain for, for sleep. And I was going over in my mind which way I wanted to try to do this. And I decided I wanted to try the method that I've just been trying. Unfortunately, I just don't have the technology. You know, 80 year old technology is beyond me. I've tried it on this machine, I've tried it on the old hand crank, and I just can't keep my vinyl in place. It just wants to move too much on me and also the gap um, when I'm sewing when I've got my foot up here and my materials down on the table it just keeps wanting to pull everything downhill. Um, so I'm going to try another method where I actually go through the board. So what I've done um, is I, I, uh, since I had that basting tape on there, I simply folded everything back. So I've got the seam where my stitching is along the edge, right on the edge of the board. Everything's folded over. And then where I have the vinyl, I just cut it close and I put a few stitches right in the center so it won't be able to, to bunch up and move backwards on me. So this is my next attempt. And I'm going to try to do this. Um, hopefully it cooperates a little bit more. And I should be able to use a regular foot on here now. And uh, I just hope everything will stay in place. I would like to use a glue. Um, but unfortunately when I trim this back, that's going to probably make a mess. And you'll be able to see it. I could probably use basting tape on the edge and that would at least try to help it stay in place. Uh, let me think about that. The electric machine is doing much, much better, um, but I keep breaking thread. I've gone to a larger size needle, hoping to make more room um, and I don't know if that's just a product of going through so many materials and the, and the board in there. Um, I've retimed it, the hook and the needle. It seemed to be right on. I, I gave it just a tiny bit extra room between the hook and the needle. And it's still, still wanting to snag up on me. So I'm going to try gluing this along the edge. 
and see if I can eliminate completely the moving problem. And I'll continue to go slow. I just don't know what else I can do to uh, keep that thread from breaking on me. So I'm going to put this on. Just barely putting some power to the motor. I'm doing this mostly by hand with the wheel. After fighting me and fighting me hard, I finally got it to where I'm okay with it. Finally happy with it. Um, what I ended up doing was changing out thread. It just kept shredding that, pulling the strands apart, and uh, finally changed that spool out to a different gray, and uh, that worked a lot better. So now I'm just going to trim this up and then we'll be done with it. Well, there you have it. Not 100% perfect in my opinion, but they they look pretty good and they're going to work just fine. I need to get some new end caps trim pieces for the edging there, um, but other than that, they are ready to go back in. Now, would I do it again this way? Probably not. Um, the next time, I would probably make the chipboard clamshell sew it all the way around and then sew my edging on that would I think be the next way to go um, especially if you don't have a machine strong enough to go through this masonite type product um, you definitely want to do it that way but it seemed to be no problem for this this old worn out juki to go through this board so you know um, trying to do it the way it was originally done once again, I don't know how they did it. It's amazing. I would love to know if anyone out there knows how they could have possibly done that. That intricate of detail, that fine of stitching, that, that fine of folds on that old vinyl edging, 
how they could have kept that all straight and in line, it's beyond me. But uh, like I said, they were craftsmen back then, and they knew how to do it. So I thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to consider this a success. Um, maybe sometime we'll recover some other sun visors, and uh, we'll look at the other more common method, <laughs> the, the socially acceptable method of doing it. I just got to... I always have to do it as close as I can to the original, even when it doesn't matter. So, anyway, thanks again, guys. God bless you. See you next time. We suggest that you like and subscribe now.